Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Wei T. Lightheart with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And today we're going to talk with Dr. Paul Maximus. And we were originally going to get into mood meditation and mental high performance, but we go right into it. And we've had a long uh, histor historic relationship. He was on podcast number 25, where we talked about the five most important tests that people could do. And I refer to that all the time because I think it's great. But today we're going to dive into uh, Dr. Max, uh, Maximus's life, um, particularly in his ability to transcend um, a, a dire state of depression as a young man and to go off and become literally going from an anorexic depressed marathon runner who turned into a heavyweight natural bodybuilding champion, an international bodybuilding transformation coach, and ultimately a naturopathic physician. Dr. Maximus knows transformation. And, you know, through his uh, philosophy soldering uh, rock bottom, Dr. Paul did the hard work of remaking himself step by step from borderline suicidal, max antidepressant, university dropout to doctor, guide, and teacher he is today. His obsession, delivering the same depth of transformation that rewrote his trajectory years ago so that you too can have the body, health, and mind you deserve, because what a man can be, he must be. And I have a great affinity uh, for Dr. Maximus. We've been great friends for many years. I was able to help him at one critical stage of his life. He's been able to help me uh, in other stages of my life, and that's what the foundation of a great friendship is. And so I hope you enjoy this relatively informal, fun, and to the max conversation on something that's really real, and that is how to deal with depression and what is the opportunity should you be feeling that today? I hope you love this episode. Take care. All of us is like an apartment. We're all like a condo tower, right? And there, and we think that it's managed by one person. It's not. There's, there's a guy in the penthouse and there's a guy in the basement and they take turns managing the building. And <laughs> And so the guy in the basement, when it's his turn to manage, obviously he wants to break windows and have a party and like leave stuff thrown out. The value of the tower just plummets, right? Somebody comes to visit, it looks, it looks awesome, but if that sustains, it goes into total dilapidation. The guy in the penthouse is the guy who like brings his mom, kisses his mom, like waxes philosophical. He does the charity events. He's the guy who like in his best dressed stuff only shows you the side that like is his best, his prefront, his most evolved, so to yes. speak, part, right? Yes. And so when he's in charge of the value of the, of the building just skyrockets, he takes care of the landscaping. He's got the plumbers, the electrical, not a single light goes out that doesn't get fixed. So all of us have both of these guys that, in different cadences go back and forth managing the building there's no such thing as somebody who just has one or the other they go back and forth and it yeah. depends on the the it depends on the 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 ratio between the two and the and how good of partners they are how well they know each other and respect each other that determines how different jekyll and hyde like the management is um so i've used this analogy so much when i've talked to guys who are like after a weekend blowout I mean, the lowest hanging fruit is everybody wants to drop fat. So everybody knows they need to eat better. Weekends come along, everybody eats like old at Monday morning, they come around for their coaching check-in. Oh, I'm so embarrassed to say this. I did the total opposite of everything I committed to last week. I don't know what happened. Yeah, the man in the basement happened. You were the man in the basement. Like you get used to him. He's always going to be there. You can't white knuckle him harder and harder and harder. Expect that's the way you're going to get rid of him. You have to make friends with him. You have to have him let, let him run the building at some cadence where you can clean it up, where you can keep managing, where you can kind of, so I use this analogy so much because even just as far as staying on a diet, it applies, let alone guys who go and do stuff that they shouldn't have done extramarital, what it like big, bigger stuff where the man in the basement comes in and, and ruins something big. Um, it's so it goes back to like the modularization. We are all these, we're the man in the basement and the man in the penthouse. And anybody who pretends that they're just one, usually it's the penthouse. I'm just the penthouse guy. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. you're not. Yeah. You're waiting for him to burn. You're waiting for the man in the basement to come around and pyro the whole place up. The more, the more you put yourself up in the penthouse and imagine there's nobody in the basement. I always say the, the, the more polished the perfection is, the, uh, more perverse 
the, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, perversion becomes. Oh, in other words, the, 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 the distortion, the, the, the distortion between main, the, the amount of energy units that it requires to maintain this idealistic aspect. I think the guy downstairs starts to grow in power yeah. and influence and malevolence and, and, and eventually that's going to happen. And I think we see that a lot in the movie stars in fame who are essentially caricatures of themselves. And um, I was listening to Matthew McConaughey. Um, Green McConaughey, lights? Or how you say it? Yeah, on yeah. Jordan Peterson's podcast. He did a great interview. And he was talking about how, you know, he, he remembers when he became famous. So he said, you know, I, I went down to uh, Santa Monica <laughs> on a Friday before the movie came out, had my fish sandwich <laughs> and uh, about 300 people down there, about uh, 297 of them didn't know me and three did, a couple girls thought I might've been cute. Well, then the movie hit, I came down to Santa Monica here on a, in, in the promenade down around one o'clock on Monday, same time, going for the same fish sandwich, about 300 people there. 298 of them recognized me. <laughs> right? <It's> like, <laughs> and then 100 people I put out to 100 movies, 99 of them didn't <laughs> talk to me. On Thursday, on Monday, uh, 99 of those people that didn't talk to me were reaching out to me. And, so, and then he kind of goes on about how he got to a point and he kept giving himself passes about his personal behavior because on certain areas of his life, which he could get away with because he was famous, but he was suffering consequences too. And then so at what point do I need it? And then he started writing that whole book about green lights, red lights. It's pretty interesting. So it's a pretty good. interesting component because I it's... think so many people strive for fame and you know, fame is based on um, value uh, associated with the tribal society that guarantees a certain level of survival. Mm. But the interesting point is when things go wrong or things go sideways, there's a, there's a reverse aspect to that where the person at the top of the ladder takes the biggest fall or the top yeah. of the tower, like, it's almost as if the, 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 the mob turns against them and can't wait. And we see this with star sports athletes that have the haters. We see the superstardom actor or big businessman and people love it when they get blown up or their life goes to shambles. And then they get down to the basement, but then society only wants to keep them down at the basement for so long. Then they and they want to come, they the want to come back. back story. <laughs> and I think we're vicar like with that, we vicariously live out our own lives through this observational structure that's built in this voyeuristic nature that is built in which has gone to the absolute zenith in a technological age like people aren't actually living their lives as a person anymore mm -hmm. where we're viewing lives through this medium that we're exchanging from but they're not actually living it they're actually sitting at home staring into a screen living out a fantasy world that they're projecting themselves into on some level, which is a very <laughs> poor representation of what life can really be by living it. And going back to your initial point, which is about, hey, I'm gonna work this many hours and I'm gonna spend the rest of my time making sure that I am still that professional that came out of school as a medical doctor, as a naturopathic doctor, as that professional that people are buying into, but also maintaining um, on the bleeding edge because we're in this rapid rate of expansion of technological innovation where like you cannot possibly keep up with the new developments in any field 
let alone multiple fields. Huge. So, so, which leads me, I guess, to the next thing. So for our listeners, as you can say, I'm, ta- I'm talking with Dr. Paul Maximus. Uh, he's a naturopathic doctor. We've had a long, deep friendship uh, for many, many years, and he's done a lot of work with me. You can check out episode number 25 yeah, we're just I, catching I, up here I, uh, where I, he goes I, the five tests that every man yeah. needs to have um i use that as my bible every year and dr paul for those of you who don't know is kind of the the picture picture perfect person in my history of the guy that i admire the most has kind of done the most He's kind of like if you if you built a if you built a machine and you put in like the genetics and you put in (laughs) the body structure and you put in the brain structure and you put in the personality and you kind of like took this perfect combination of ingredients to bake the the personality of a of a human (laughs) being, you're like my ideal standard. And it's like, God, man. You know, and, and, and I love that I have all these faults and flaws and I'm okay with them. <laughs> it makes me feel good when, oh. when I'm around uh, someone such as yourself. So, so what's, uh, what's new and exciting um, in Dr. Maximus's world? Well, if only people knew when, when we first met, it's because I was reaching out to the great Wade Lightheart for coaching and mentorship and seeing you in exactly that, uh, in exactly that prism. So it's, it's awesome to be able to give it back after many, many years to finally catch up and have something <laughs> to give back. <laughs> well, you know, so you've got a great clinic and you're dealing with high performance um, people, people that want to have the most out of life, that's dealing with an increasingly complex world. As I talk about all the time, you know, you know, there's these standards out there that we've got to be like single digit body fats. We've got to be making millions of dollars a year. We've got to be uh, a a tantric sex God or goddess in the bedroom. Um, We need to have some sort of creative expression. Like, you know, I do sculpting or art, or I make like beautiful music on the side. I recite poetry and I've read the entire summation of the great books of the Western world and can debate with philosophers at the various Ted talks in order to uh, put forth my ideas. And of course, everyone comes short to that. So, so your journey is pretty interesting. You know, you had the, you know, for those who didn't listen to 25, you want to talk about your journey to be the person you are today and how you are helping people cope with the complexities of society from as, as a health practitioner, as a high performance uh, naturopathic doctor. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's been a long road. Uh, I think we all, we all have sort of frameworks and tools and, and ways that we view the world, right? And, and you have a toolbox. We all have, you're born with a toolbox. Your parents give you a couple of tools. You pick up a couple along the way. Something comes along that's a stressor and you, you get tested. The, the toolkit gets tested for some people really, really early in childhood, whether there's some traumatic experience or um, whenever some people might be late in life, you're not really tested until the death of a spouse or something. Uh, for me, I was first really tested when I moved off to university and I realized that my toolkit sucked. Um, my, my main what was tool, life before that, what was like, like, how was a normal, I was a, reg, I was a, I was a normal, regular kid. My dad's a surgeon. So I was like type a hardworking, played street hockey, did my homework, learned Lithuanian on the side. Like we were, we were a, a Lithuanian, you know, a, a Lithuanian immigrant ish kind of family. Um, very kind of traditional sort of secluded doing our own thing like Lithuanian studies and we spoke Lithuanian at home as the first language growing up we actually got in trouble speaking English when I was growing up until eventually my mom and dad couldn't contain it anymore and then it was like ah, oh, whatever now it's all English um, so it was a it was a pretty like normal immigrant-ish kind of upbringing right you're maintaining this culture that's not really here but your your uh, uh, what's it called entropy or enthalpy? Which one's the one with the chaos? You're tr- you're trying to well, entropy is entropy ending into can- chaos, and syntropy is the reforming into more complex systems. Yeah, so you're so you're trying to like maintain this complex system within this entropic or whatever environment, this Canadian culture that's pulling it out in every direction. So 
I grew up, you know, uh, under that sort of a, an, an arc and, uh, I went off to university and, uh, and depression hit, you know, and, and didn't hit initially abruptly. It kind of snuck up, it crept up underneath me. And it was just this feeling of like heaviness, these thoughts that, that like these thoughts of heaviness and, and a pessimistic way of looking at the world and a stress that you just can't seem to get rationally, you can't get past, uh, and, and one of the tools that I had, the only tool really that I had that I was effective enough to abate it was long distance running. So I ran and I ran, I ran, I ran. My dad was a marathon runner. I was, I had, you know, done, done, I think for 10 months at one point, I did a half marathon every week for 10 months, just in training and keeping myself afloat in first year. At the end of first year, my, my body gave out basically. I couldn't, couldn't do my one coping strategy anymore. And depression hit me like a ton of bricks just landed on me. And, and it was at that point that I had to drop out of school. I was put on a bunch of antidepressants. I effectively was completely broken. I went down to 133 pounds. So I was clinically anorexic and, and, and depressed. And you're how tall? You're how tall six foot two, six right. foot one, six foot two. Yeah. Like I was a bean pole. I was really, really thin. And, and the one thing that I had, the, the long distance running, I didn't have it anymore. And so suddenly I needed help. And, and, and this is something I was hoping to, to touch on today because uh, with coronavirus and everything people have experienced, all the stresses that people have experienced, hmm. there's, there's a looming wave of depression that either people have already started to feel or that's coming. There's some World Health Organization stats suggesting that depression's continually on the rise it's going to keep building um and so i went to the doctor i was putting on antidepressants second because i I just want to interject here Mm -hmm. how would you classify as a clinician what is the definition of depression i think there's a lot of misidentification or unidentification i don't know if that's that's really a word Mm -hmm. the the lack thereof like i when you when you give me that description I just probably, I could probably say that almost all everyone in the community that I grew up in small town Canada was probably suffering from depression. Sure, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> Other than the odd church growers singing, singing in the choir, pretty much like <laughs> depression was, you alleviated depression by getting liquored on Friday night. The like norm, that's totally. Yeah, and, and there's a, the DSM has a, has a set of criteria that somebody can go and check off. There's a Hamilton depression inventory, a Beck depression inventory. If somebody's wondering, they can, they can go and score themselves effectively on on a on a continuum it's everything at the extreme and that you would imagine to be unable to function you know heaviness persistent pervasive personal permanent thoughts that are heavy and pessimistic um there's a putting aside the dsm's criteria which is which is very um very well fleshed out people can google it i like to look at situations like this under the four d's the four D's of psychopathology. And, and this is, this is not airtight. It's not like you can diagnose somebody right. walking down the street, put right. the four D's and see like, Hey, there's some warning signs. Pay it's a framework. Yeah, help. totally. It's a framework. And so the first D is danger. If you're either a danger to yourself, you're suicidal or you're a danger to somebody else, get help right away. You meet the criteria for psychopathology. Mm-hmm. D is danger. Second one is deviance. How weird are you compared to the average person? It's not, it's not diagnostic on its own. Weirdness can be a really good thing. We want weird creative artists. We want weird producers. We want Which weirdness. many of them suffer from depression, interesting enough. Totally, totally. Yeah, so, it, so it's not on its own. It's not a diagnosis. We want some weirdness, but how weird are you can be another, another you know, uh, clue. Third one is deviance. How, sorry, uh, what I say, danger, uh, deviance, the weirdness, uh, dysfunction is the third. And so if you can't get out of bed, you're, you're not able to make enough money to sustain yourself. All your relationships are burning down. You're dysfunctional. So you'd meet that third D. And the last one's distress. Are you stressed out about your situation? Obviously, if you are, whether it's a pathology, a diagnosable pathology or not, get help. You're going to feel better connecting with somebody, talking with somebody about it. So I like to apply the four D's when it comes to, is this a problem? Am I just sad having a regular emotion of kind of retreat and defensiveness and kind of self-soothing? 
or am I have has this been protracted? It's been two or three months. Really, life's going down the toilet. I'm not functioning. I'm not getting out of bed. I haven't showered in three days. Like that's where you're starting to check more and more of those boxes, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, um, I was checking those boxes. I, I was not functioning. I couldn't hold a job. I, I had 40s initially on a part-time basis at school. And then I had to drop out even of that because I wasn't able to get out of bed. Uh, I, got, I got fired from two jobs and I got put on antidepressants. Initially, you know, thinking that those would be really helpful for me. Those would lift me up. Those would, those would do everything. Take the pill and I'm good to go again, right? Everything's going to be <sighs> rainbows and unicorns. And obviously it didn't, right? And so I floundered along for a little while. I was put on a medication, swap the dose, swap, you know, increase the dose, swap the medication. This happened for a couple of months. I, I, I just kind of kept floundering. And antidepressants, they are more effective than placebo. Placebo, studies have shown placebo has about a 35% uh, success rate in depression and antidepressants have about a 55%. So you're looking at about 20% increase over placebo, right? So it's not, it's not earth shattering, but it is more effective. We have, these are meta-analyses. We have tons of them. Now the, the, the mechanisms are, are in debate because could this be a serotonin deficiency? Could it be because some SSRIs are anti-inflammatory at the same time? So it's masking a dietary insufficiency. Uh, this, this to me kind of puts us in the, in the realm of the conversation of what are the theories of depression, which, which is a fascinating area to me because when I was depressed and I went to the doctor and I said, I'm depressed, I'm not getting into bed, I'm crying, blah, 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 like help me. He said, oh, you have a serotonin deficiency. Your brain is effectively broken. You need to take this pill. It'll fix your deficiency. And you can talk to somebody if you want. And that was kind of it. So I went home and I remember crying, taking the first pill in my, in my ex-girlfriend's driveway, just that pill admitting to yourself that I'm broken. I don't know what the solution is. Nobody really knows except this pill is going to fix it. And so I remember just like, that's the ultimate, you let go and just, I'm busted. Nobody really knows what to do. Hope this hit pill is a Hail Mary. Here we go kind of thing. Right. And of course the pill didn't on its own, 20% more than placebo, it didn't really lift me significantly to the point where I, where I felt like, okay, job is done. Let's go get my life back together again. So in the depression theories, there's a serotonin hypothesis there's, uh, there's micronutrient deficiencies. My diet at the time obviously sucked because I was training so hard. There's cortisol to testosterone imbalances. There's sleep, uh, sleep, you know, irregularities, which obviously I had there's, there's the psychological contribution, your frameworks, the way you see the world, the way you analyze things, the meaning you put onto things, your principles, your values, if they exist, if you, if you have even explicated them, you know, are maybe not heading in the direction you want them to go. Um, you know, maybe one of the more interesting theories to me though, cause that's all, that's all the medical stuff. If somebody's listening and they're like, I'm depressed. I I've scored myself and, or I just feel like I could feel a lot better. Um, you know, what should I do first? Go see your doctor because even it's not to go get an antidepressant though. Maybe it'll help 20%. Remember, uh, but first rule out, make sure it's not a B12 deficiency or an anemia or, you know, a, a hypogonadism, your testosterone is really low, or it could be, could be a chronic infection, could be addiction, pain, could be anything else. And it's not just, you need an antidepressant. It's you fix the other thing and depression will fix itself. Right. Right. And, and would um, you say that there's a, a, a pretty solid base to, in today's world, that there's a lot of uh, contributing factors that lead to the end result classified as depression, because we really altered human social structure, human agricultural, human, like, like pretty much every aspect of human nature has been radically altered in the last 80 years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, and there's a ton of con- contributions, right? Mm-hmm. And so if, if somebody goes and sees a doctor and they're only getting an, an antidepressant, uh, it's, it's, it's like the story of the five blind guys 
in the elephant the elephant right because right. you're you're only fixing tail, the tail it's the legs it's the yeah. belly <laughs> you're only fixing the tail cuz that's the only part the doctor has been trained to see or that they have time to address or maybe get a, a tail and a leg if you get an antidepressant plus a pharmaceutical or plus a talk therapy you go and talk to somebody mm -hmm. and so it's not the full elephant you have to take a step back and 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 work with somebody or or read learn acquire the resources to be able to figure out what exactly is going on so serotonin hypothesis, underlying medical diagnoses. There's a whole bunch of tests we talked about in the past, in the past uh, interview we did. What episode was that one more time? Episode 25, the five tests that everybody needs to do. I and refer so, to that all the time. And I think it's a great series. Dude, I saw this. I saw this as well. I love this. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Oh, thanks. Um, and, uh, by the way, that's, for those listening, that was the blue, the, the biological blueprint book is basically how Matt and I go at figuring all kinds of weird stuff out. <laughs> it is a Bible, man. There's, it's really dense. It's fantastic. Uh, it's, it's like the, the holy, book. it's like the holy grail. So. <laughs> you should see the next book. Oh, that's really? Book. It's out of control. That's amazing. I can't wait <laughs> to see it. This is already like a holy grail. Yeah. I was stoked to see it. Um, and, um, so, so you've got the serotonin hypothesis, a bunch of medical hypotheses, rule out all those tests. Uh, another area that I think is interesting is the whole idea that we live in a sick society. What's that quote about? It's no, it's no accomplishment to be well adapted to a sick society. Mm -hmm. And so this is like, is your depression or your mood or your lack of high performance, you know, let's even take a step back. And when I say depression, somebody listening might be like, well, I'm not depressed. So this doesn't apply to me. Well, it totally does. Because the flip side of depression is aliveness. Right. So everything we're talking about here to fix depression, if you don't have all of this stuff fixed up, then you're not as fully alive as you could be. Which is, you know, I, I can remember listening to Dr. David Hawkins discuss fame uh, going back to that thread again, because now, you know, Andy Warhol said it best that like, hey, everybody was going to get to a point where they got their 15 minutes of fame and maybe it's 15 seconds on Instagram video now. But <laughs> it was, um, he talked about how he was, uh, you know, interviewed on a famous television program and he went to this big studio and they kind of cranked up the lights and there's millions of people watching and it was like the stardom. And then, uh, and then after everything was, it was gone. Like he couldn't even find his way out of the building. He had to find a janitor to help him. And then he walked out on the street and he was just another dude on the street. And, and then he, he said in that moment, he grasped the, the shift between say someone who is a rock star with 50,000 or 100,000 people in states. And then like, then you get, you get back to life and you're just an ordinary guy that, you know, has all the normal aspects. And you see how many people with super fame would struggle because at such a peak aliveness, there needs to be the oscillating valley. But in your case, particularly, um, you kind of outlined some of the things. You're in this valley, you've taken this pill uh, under the, you know, the prescription of a, of, a, of a licensed professional. It doesn't get you kind of where you wanna go because of maybe some of the associative factors or contributors that aren't being characterized or classified or addressed mm -hmm. whether that's out of ignorance or certainly not malevolence what what steps did you take because you made quite an incredible turnaround yeah and and all of this ended up feeding into this program that i've built now called called the ultimate guide to defeating depression and it, it ultimately culminated in me going to naturopathic college and learning that there's a therapeutic approach that you should apply to every problem start from the least invasive thing and work your way up to more and more invasives. And so at the base of the pyramids should be your beliefs, your psychology, right? What, what you do masterfully in almost every, every time I chat with you, my, my beliefs are, are shifted and tweaked and, and improved. That's really the, the base of, of, of everything, every treatment, no matter what the condition is. If it's diabetes, you have to learn about diabetes. You have to you have to become self-reflective about your emotions and your eating patterns and, before you can take a diet plan or an exercise plan, you have to look at what am I doing right now? You, there's no way you can go five steps forward and adopting the latest, greatest plan if you have no idea what your current baseline is. Right. 
Right. right. So we need to know, you know, what what part of the galaxy am I in if I'm going to set the nav the computer to somewhere else? You know, it's like it's kind of like that whole scene when um, uh, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo in, in the Millennium Falcon. And he's like, well, why don't we just hit the hyperdrive? He said, listen, going into hyperspace isn't like, you know, uh, dusting crops, boy. You know, you don't get the coordinates right. You fly into a star, you know, into or into an asteroid belt or a supernova or go through like mm -hmm. you've got to know your coordinates, decide where you're going to be. There's some computational time here. And just because, you know, the Death Star is on you, shooting at you, whatever your travesty in life is, you still got to get to figure out oh, all this God. parameters before you blast off to that next destination. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. in today's kind of, hey, press a button, Amazon delivers by this afternoon. It's kind of like, wait a minute. Well, we don't even know where your address is. We don't know, we haven't, we haven't established where you actually are at. Um, how did you do that? Yeah, so, so with psychology being the base, I immediately took to, I mean, Googling at the time, basically anything I could find about depression. And, and this is to people's credit nowadays. Doctors are often you know, uh, ruffled by a patient who comes in with XYZ articles and questions and stuff. I celebrate that. I think that's amazing. If you're a patient who reads a ton online and you go to the doctor and the doctor gets mad at you for having read a bunch and have a bunch of questions, that's maybe an authoritative, not a collaborative doctor. Find a collaborative doctor who loves your enthusiasm, who loves that you're learning, who loves that you're trying and just needs to shift and redirect you to better materials to read or do a better framework. But so celebrate if you've got that scrappiness where you're trying to take, take it in your own hands and learn about it and read about it. That's awesome. Don't bury that. Celebrate that and dive in. Learn good quality stuff about whatever your condition is. So I dove in. I started reading everything about depression, especially in the psychology realm. I read a ton of Wayne Dyer stuff. I know you're familiar with him. Mm -hmm. The biggest lesson, and I read a book called Your Erroneous Zones by Dr. Okay. Wayne Dyer. Great one. Phenomenal. So pivotal. Change. I mean, there's probably five pounds of highlighter in there just because I, I highlighted every, every word almost. The biggest lesson that I got from that was that of self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, I think that, that a lot of us come into the world with the view of who can I blame? Where can I put the responsibility on somebody else and blame right. somebody else instead of saying, okay, there's a problem in front of me. 99% of it I didn't cause, but 1% of it, maybe I contributed to. So instead of saying, well, 99%, it was them. So right, 99%, I, I did nothing. No, look at own, fully own 100% of that 1% that you contributed to. Which is yeah. so pervasive in today's world. Somebody is responsible because I'm a victim of whatever, society, yeah. history, my skin color, my economic status, my gender, mm -hmm. where I am in the family, my social set. Like, I mean, there is no, there is no stop. Mm -hmm. There is like, you can, if you really want to investigate, you can be a victim real easy. There's always a reason sure. to be a sure. victim. And, yeah. and legitimately so, but mm -hmm. it doesn't get you anywhere. That's the yeah. problem. It fundamentally takes power away from you instead of giving right. you power, right? And you only build momentum. You only gain power by taking self-responsibility of whatever little part of it you can, right? So that was my battle cry. And I just took, took it on myself that if I'm going to get out of this, it's, it looks like it's not going to be the antidepressants. It was looks like the talk therapy is being really slow. What's that? Did you get to the, did, was there a moment where you got to that? Like, like was there anything that triggered that event? Because sometimes there's a... I, you know, I think I, I think it was in um, uh, th that movie uh, where the guy says, "Even even an alcoholic has a moment of clarity." Mm. You know, like, there, like there's these moments in our worst places. Maybe it's in a relationship. I remember in a in a bad relationship, there was a moment that happened that I was like, "Okay, I, I I'm I'm done with it. Like I'm I'm I, like I the suffering stops here." We need a new chart, a new path, even though it was a radical departure, what I was doing. Was there a moment that triggered that? Not that I remember. No, that was, that was, I, I just remember the book and how much I wrote in there and how much I underlined. Um, 
and so there was there was not really one moment, but I remember that whole period of time being so revolutionary for holy self responsibility as a concept. This is massive, and so that was the that was the base. That was the beginning, and the first therapist that I saw, who was just the the first one, I guess that my dad googled or found, was a Freudian psychoanalyst. Okay. And I, and I'm, I'm to this day, I'm really not a fan of Freud. He was, I think, uh, and Freudian psychology. I'll get into, I'll get it. I'll, I'll caveat that, but, uh, it, it, the framework was effectively one of kind of the blind leading the blind spinning me in circles in the dark of like, tell me more about your anger and your frustration. And mm-hmm. the more I would vent, the more it seemed like none of it was going anywhere. There was no direction. There was no framework. There was no positive. I I like to look at therapists as trampolines. And so if you go to a therapist that can bring you down, which they should be able to bring you into stuff that you don't want to talk about. And then when you leave, you get a little bit of a lift, you get some lightness, you get a different perspective, you get something where you don't have to always leave happy, 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 but they take you down and then they spring you back up so that your life ends up generally being better. Your mood gets better over time. And this was a broken trampoline, this therapist. Just every time I went, felt worse, felt worse, more confused, no framework. So when I came across humanistic psychology, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, all of Maslow's stuff, basically, some of Jung's stuff as well, it really contrasted to me how Freud was just this this pessimist who just kept turning it back to, oh, it's your childhood and blame your mom and dad and blame everybody else around you. And there was a justify that to the great clarification of the mm-hmm. subconscious and super consciousness and conscious melons, but there was like no escape from this realm. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it reinforcing it totally. And so it's just a spiral that keeps going down. And when I found humanistic psychology is a spiral going up, right. right. Uh, Maslow's hier- hierarchy of needs was, was huge first in the psychology realm. I think finding it's so important to find a therapist that you like. You know, if you go and find one, you don't jive with them the first time or two, hang in there, maybe another one or two sessions, you get through three sessions, maybe four, if you're still not vibing with them, go with somebody else. It don't, don't write off the whole field. This can be a therapist, a coach, a doctor of any stripes, find somebody that you like, whose brain you want to resonate against, because that's effectively what therapy is. You're marinating in each other's brain so that you slowly, your, your mirror neurons of thinking slowly start to take on theirs. Right, right. So that you can ideally take on some thought processes or uh, an upgraded version of beliefs that will take you out of the debilitating components of whatever psychological condition that you're suffering from. So the the therapist's job is to kind of stair step you out of the basement of your life into you know the main floor so then you can decide well do i want to add some more additions do move to a new house but you got to get you up to a functionality level where you are now competent in society and have a foundational component to build a a quality happy life yeah 100 percent. and and there's i i ended up fast forward uh, uh, we'll, we'll fill in the blank here but fast forward about a year and a half when i got everything under you know all the blocks in a in a row went back to school and I was getting nineties in psychology. And so I went back with a vengeance to study psychology and that led me down this whole path. And one of the studies that we were taught in my fourth year of, of I think it was a counseling psychology class um, was about the importance of the therapeutic alliance. There had been for a long time, same in the diet world. I mean, there's so many analogies between therapy and, and between the psychology and the, and the nutrition world where for decades, therapists were fighting it out. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the best. Dialectical behavioral therapy is the best. ACT is the best. Gestalt, humanistic, Freudianism. They were just duking it out. Mine's better than yours. Right. And, and eventually some researchers, I forget their names, came and put together all the studies they could find on the effect sizes of all these different, different means of doing therapy. And they found that the overwhelming predictor of if somebody got better was not the type of therapy they did, although there are some that are better for some conditions than others. It was overwhelmingly something called the therapeutic alliance. How connected did you feel to the person sitting across the coffee table? Right, wow. And that was the number one predictive variable. Doesn't matter what therapist, what their perspective, what their approach, personality differences, you know, included in that. 
it was the therapeutic alliance. How, how well connected did you feel to them? How much did you, did you feel, you know, seen and heard and validated and trusting? Just as a curiosity, uh, cause I'm, um, an amateur student of neurochemistry and neurophysiology in the creation of new neural pathways. You know, our company, we now have Newtopia, which is providing nutritional solutions for neurochemical optimization. And then I also am a student of neuro, neurofeedback where we're repatterning um, new neural connections. And of course, that's a big aspect of my background in exercise physiology and training to your training, you know, highly refined motor skills or, or excitatory motor neurons. Do you feel that that connectivity that you have to the therapist, it creates a neurochemical kind of optimal environment where new patterning in a positive aspect is is a key element to to, to the development of what i would say um cognitive capacities that allow you to function as a as a as a person in society would you think would you think that might be the reason why from a from a if you want to get kind of a scientific theory kind of method for sure yeah there's there's something called neuroplasticity neurons that fire together wire together people in in marketing will often say oh so and so um, supplement or technology or gadget changes your brain. Everything changes your brain. Every right. minute of every day, right. your brain is changing. It's adapting. If I say the word blue or the word orange, your brain just changed because right. you heard a set of patterns, you interpreted them. Your brain fundamentally is changing every second based on what it's taking in. Not completely from the ground up, obviously, but it's constantly tweaking and adapting. So, pruning neurons that haven't needed to needed to touch in a while strengthening ones that are being used every day it's adaptation it's evolution in in your brain every second so yeah 100 percent. so so you've got to find somebody who you want to to be able sure. to kind of like reintegrate your brain and uh, another theory in depression is that there can be trauma there can be something that that you uh struggled with or suffered with whatever it was that a part of the brain got walled off almost like this hyperactive node got walled off and put over at the side and and literally it's it's a part of the brain that gets kind of walled off and is not not in communication as far as neuroplasticity is concerned with the other ones and so a therapist can help you to to ask questions to ask you how is your nervous system is your heart rate what you just moved what was that they get you aware so that you can start to integrate that part of you that doesn't want to be conscious and doesn't want to realize that, oh, my heart rate just went up or I just went uncomfortable and fidgeted. They help you reintegrate and see that it's okay. You can become aware of that, reintegrate it, and then you own it again. It's almost like having an attic in the house where you live and die in this house and you never check the attic. If you go up there, it's scary. There's cobwebs, there's unknown. You go up there with the right tools you have a, a new man cave up there. It's awesome. Funny you should refer to that too, because if you even look at people who are like high states poker players, they're looking for tells uh -huh. associated with the hands that people are playing or the bets that they're placing. And of course, the 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 higher the intensity of the betting or the the the, the bid or the ask or the, the the pot or whatever it happens to be the more relative or the more subtle, like these, the, the highest levels are people that are picking up these components because the numbers at, at that level, everybody knows the numbers, uh -huh. right? Everybody's got the statistical stuff, but the real people are to be able to extract that, which is the art, I would say, from a professional in your field as a medical, this is where the art of the particular practitioner comes in with the science. We know the numbers, we know the studies, we know the possible things, but now we need to finesse, if you will, mm -hmm. the, the, the humanness, the human aspect of the, of the thing. And that's why having a therapist that correlates is really important. Would that be accurate? And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, rapid cheap meal relief. Research shows that cheat meals can actually be an effective way to boost your metabolism. One key weight loss hormone, leptin, can be increased by up to 30% following a cheat meal. 
The challenge with the cheat meals is that all those extra calories and lower food quality can be hard to digest, which means you could be totally sidelined with a food coma after big cheat meals. The solution is to take strong digestive enzymes like masszymes, which will help rapidly digest and break down the extra food. Three to five capsules before or right after your cheat meal can make a huge difference in how you feel following the cheat meal. If it's a cheat day with multiple large meals, you might want to go up to 10 capsules or higher to help you power through all that food. To save 10% on masszymes, go to masszymes.com. That's M A S S. Z-Y-M-E-S dot com and enter the code cheat 10 at checkout. 100%. 100%. So, um, and, and really loving this, by the way, going awesome. Going back to theories, you know, theories of depression, why depression exists. I think one of the most powerful theories that people don't know is the evolutionary theory. Why does depression still exist? If evolution plucks off things that are not good for reproduction, why do we still have people not able to get out of bed, not able to pay their bills, busting down relationships? Why does it persist in our genes? And there's an answer because otherwise it wouldn't exist, right? So there's a quote, I uh, forget the guys, it's some Russian guy. He said, nothing in, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. Mm. And this is so true. If something doesn't make sense, but it's across a wide variety of people, you have to look back in time to say, how could this have been preserved as an ad- ad- adaptive, um, as an adaptation, right? So if we look at depression, what is depression? Depression is fundamentally withdrawing from society, decreasing your activity level to conserve energy. Right. And so what are you conserving energy from? There have been a number of these medical hypotheses published where we're looking at depression wrong if we're just trying to hurry the person along and just kickstart them to get out of this depression. You're not really fixing the adaptive mechanism here of why the person is, their biology is responding to to become depressed. You can either look at this and say, this is a dysfunction. We need to fix it. The medical approach of Oh, if it's down, just bring it, bring it up at all costs. Don't ask why, just bring it up. Say, okay, why is it going down? Because maybe it's, there's some intelligence there that, that we're not fully appreciating when we're trying to fight the current. And, and, and this splinters off depending on, on what your situation is, right? Uh, there, there's something called sickness behavior. And so if you are legitimately sick, what do you do? What do you do when you're low on B12 or iron or whatever it is? You're not going to go and run to your, to your, to your limit. You are going to conserve even within the reduced limits that you have. So there's sickness behavior that, that there may be something medically that your body's responding to saying, I need to conserve energy. I need to sit back. Second thing is that depressives tend to be pessimistic. And pessimists, studies have been done on this repeatedly, that if you give like a jar of jelly beans to an optimist and a pessimist, and you ask both of them to guess how many beans are in here, guess who's more likely to be right? The pessimist. The pessimist is more accurate. They're not happy, but they're accurate. The optimist says there's 3,000 jelly beans because that's what they want to believe. Right. They want to believe there's 3,000, there's only 1,000 in there, Right. So pessimists tend to be more accurate when, when there's some ambiguity, right? They tend to be more analytical. They tend to be, to be more, more um, you know, more protective, more defensive. So if there's a rustling bush over there, the optimist is going to say, it must be a million dollars and rushes into the bush. Right. The says there could be something that's going to kill me. I'm not going to go near that bush, right? right. And, and, and lastly, Evolution has given us this mechanism of depression so that when there's stressors happening, even social stressors, psychological stressors, let alone the biology, to to be able to step back and really focus uninterrupted. Don't pick up the phone. Nobody call me. Nobody talk to me. I just want to sit and ruminate about my problem. Right. And and if you don't have the right tools and the right frameworks, then you ruminate forever ineffectively. The problem isn't the rumination. It's the effectiveness of the rumination, which is why 
psycho psychotherapy, ruminating with somebody there catalyzes it, speeds it up. And you end up being a really empathic, really in, introspective, emotionally intelligent person at the end of it. It's a, it's a gift. It's a monster gift. Um, but if you don't have that, if you're not journaling, if you're not meditating, you're not reflecting, you're not processing it, of course, you're just going to ruminate and spin your wheels forever. And you're going to, you're going to stay depressed for decades, never fixing what evolution's trying to get you to focus on a fix. The other thing is when people are depressed, what do they tend to eat? Do they tend to eat vegetables and healthy fats. Yeah, they're, they're getting sugar because they need to pump up their neurochemicals. Exactly. So they're looking for, they're looking not only maybe for the dopamine lift or the serotonin lift, they're also looking to conserve energy. So right. I know that I've got this big, you know, husband cheated on wife, wife withdraws. She, now she's got to balance all these thoughts of I've got this kid, I got the husband, I got what am I going to do? She's got to step back and think about it. And evolution gives you this mechanism to become depressed and, and withdrawn and to eat, to conserve, to eat hyper processed hyper palatable processed foods just to give you that kind of like energy to be able to work out the problem source of energy from its pure aspect is like it's it's a, it's a short loop yeah yeah and, and <laughs> so consequences yeah and so if that continues forever obviously you compound the problem because now you have magnesium deficiency and if you stay indoors now you got a vitamin d deficiency and if you're not eating any any good omega-3s now you got a omega-3 fatty acid deficiency so it, the longer it goes without the proper tools the more it turns into a chronic disabling condition that now evolution is going to pluck you out of the gene pool because evolution didn't mean for this to last ongoing forever and ever and ever and that's and that's, that's for it that's to come stay for a few few days few weeks few months and then leave when it's longer than a year let's say i'm pulling that number out of nowhere when it's longer than a year then it starts to become okay what's not being solved here because this is not what depression programmed right right and i think there's a lot of people that are really suffering from that and i think you know it's it's important to recognize there are going to be times in your life where for good reason you're kind of down and mm -hmm. there's going to be times in your life where there's, for good reason they're going to be up mm -hmm. neither one of those are a static situation are indicators of the vacillations of a life you know we kind of live like a sine wave i've always been more of a physicist than i have been a chemist um and i see everything as you know vibrations waves and you know is it is it light is it matter it depends on you know the observer and the intensity and the frequency and the mechanisms of observation. So as someone who has been in this situation and turned it around, what are the tools that a person can use or leverage to be in observance? Because I think like you were indicated early in the conversation that we're probably heading into an unprecedented level of mass depression in society thanks to not the virus the mitigations instilled by the authority figures that we trust to run our society have implemented an activity that had consequences that weren't i think thoroughly vetted by dealing with the the covid virus so well, and it's called the, it's, it's either a sick society or a weird world. This compounds depression, right? If, if you are indoors, you're not able to go outside. You're not able to connect with loved ones. We're tribal. You have to connect and see people and, and be close to each other. It's a, we're a Petri dish for depression. When we stack up these things where we have to stare at a screen and we're not getting real connection, just hitting these like buttons, mm -hmm. you're not able to go and hug somebody and be face to face with somebody. You, you can't just pick up and go running or go exercising, which I, I mean, cavemen easily clocked eight kilometers a day, sometimes 15 kilometers a day on average. Now, what do we get? Maybe two on a treadmill, People three, day, three days a week. Get that in a week. Yeah. And so, of course, you're, you're, of course you're, you're, your body is inclined to be kind of lethargic and heavy and tired because you're, not, you're in a weird world. You've created this weird world for your genes. That's not, not what they were used to. And this is not what evolution is asking you to do. Somebody, if they exercise and the depression gets better, 
it, it wasn't a depressive, like it wasn't an ad, ad, adaptation by evolution telling you to go and lay on the couch for three weeks straight. Right. It was that you were in a weird world where you weren't exercising and that was a flaw in the system, not, not a benefit. That wasn't a feature that was built in. That was just, you didn't do the basic mechanics of your car. So your car broke down. And so that, so I put all that stuff into practice, immediately started learning about nutrition okay, I got to stop eating these processed foods. I got to eat more vegetables and proteins and healthy fats. And uh, instead of long distance running is very effective as far as, anti, as far as an antidepressant effect. It's still, I think, to my knowledge, the most effective exercise you can do. Just and I think endorphin, I, I, endorphin production in part, if there's a pain condition underneath, then that, that's going to give you the runner's high. It's going to give the serotonin. But I think from an evolutionary perspective, if you think about depression being a, being a ruminant thing, running gives you that repetitive ruminant it gives you a, a a place where you like a piston you're going back and forth thinking about your thoughts you're able to ping through problems in your unconscious and so it's, it's just a way of it's another way of fixing the problem instead of journaling or talking to somebody you're 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 working through it in your unconscious by moving and it's this repetitive rhythmic motion and that's where any exercise is great right yoga weightlifting, anything that's going to increase your sense of self-efficacy and groundedness and, and self-awareness. But especially if you can add in a little bit of jogging, that's going to help you process anything that is on your mind. Um, so any kind of exercise is better than none. If you're depressed, go for a walk every single day around the block and then slowly build up from there. You'll see, even if it doesn't fix everything, your mood will go up because that's what humans were supposed to do. You just weren't doing it. Walking is my favorite form, by the way, for people. And, uh, you know, years ago, when I ran into all that trouble in my own life, which you were instrument in helping me identify with some of the tests, I had moved to a place where I couldn't walk on a daily basis because of the environment in the city. And number one, I gained a bunch of weight. Number two, I was chasing um, the extraneous components of success and taking on more responsibility than I was capable of managing and there was a lot, but, and then led to keen nutritional deficiencies, which then had a correlated cascade effect on hormones and everything else. Like, so, so there was, there was these progressions that I was able to kind of push to the side. But one of the things when I came back into the city is that I began to do is go for my walks again, because for me, that's my best management system. Mm -hmm. You know, something's bothering me. Something's not going on. Hey, you know what? I'm not going to take the car down the street. I'm going to go for a walk. So for me, living in a place where I can walk on a daily basis is, is really critical to my mental health. 100%. Right. And that also gets you sunlight. Another big factor for mood that also gets you out in nature. We have a ton of studies on on seeing green and how, it, I mean, for God's sake, seeing green, there are studies on it. How much more evidence do you need that we're supposed to be in nature? We're supposed to be surrounding ourselves with the, the elements that we've had for millions of years, not a screen six inches away from your face in a, in a you know, four walled room, no windows. Like it's just not normal. No. And so, so getting outdoors with seeing green and smelling fight insides and forest bathing, all this kind of stuff, of course, that's going to lift your mood. Um, so I started putting all that stuff into practice. That was the nutrition, the exercise, sleep was another one. Instead of staying up late, watching, watching South Park or whatever to turn my brain off and, right. and eating hyper palatable stuff. Now I had to go to sleep because I worked out really hard and I'm kind of tired. So then you start working on your sleep routines and oh, red light and blue light and the circadian rhythms and magnesium, tryptophan, you start adding glycine, all these other things and you sleep better. And the next day you wake up with more energy. And it's just the momentum fuels itself. You start get, seeing that spiral going upwards. So fixed my nutrition, fixed my exercise, fixed my sleep. The psychology frameworks were massive, obviously. There was a lot of stuff there as far as looking at my principles. Uh, there's a couple of exercises that, that I did at the time that were really helpful. One was writing out my principles. Another one was looking at who are my board of advisors. In your head, who are the people, the five people where if you could make up an, an imaginary board of advisors and whenever you have a problem, you go, you close the door and you imagine that you're there with your five board of advisors and you say, 
Winston Churchill, he's not one of mine, but Winston Churchill, what do you think about this problem? Okay, Barack Obama, what do you think about this? Whoever your board of advisors are, I'm just throwing names out. Yeah, which was the origination of the mastermind by Napoleon Hill. Mm. Mm-hmm. Was it was it created a board of advisors in his mind, and he said the characters started to take on like personalities and everything else. They'd be fighting at the table of his boardroom in his mind. Yeah, and and from there I started started pulling people in that I wanted to to emulate to some degree. Jack Lalanne, Tony Robbins, Kelly Starrett. There was a number of these people where I mean Wayne Dyer was in there. There was a, a bunch of these people where I started seeing myself taking on pieces of them and adapting them into my personality. Like Jim Rohn says, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Those don't have to be real, actual people. That could be the stuff you read, the movies you watch, the music you listen to. Your brain is always adapting. So what are you putting into it, right? So uh, the board of advisors was a huge thing. Um, uh, What else? What else? We started working out too. You started lifting weights. Oh, yeah. So I put on 74 pounds in 13 months. How much was it? 74 pounds in 13 months. (laughs) Monster. You you almost doubled your body weight and you certainly doubled your muscle mass. It's just stupid. The photos are just stupid. Yes. Uh, And and there were no drugs. Ronnie Ronnie, I believe, was the program. That's right. That's right. It was a book written by Dr. John Berardi. And that that really catapulted the nutrition and the training side of things for me. Uh, And uh, so, I, I mean the most out there thing I was using was creatine. There was no, there were no drugs involved. I started obviously ahead of the starting blocks because I was 133 pounds. I wasn't even normal body weight. So put another 30 on there. I maybe gained 40 pounds in a year. That's out there, but more reasonable. Um, Still outrageous. Still outrageous. But I I had a, I had a, I, I slingshotted basically past normal, which brings me to another framework that Wayne Dyer has, which is called the extra mile. He says, it's never crowded along the extra mile. And I imagine that there's kind of a slope between A, B, and C. A is like death, death's door. It's Hawkins, bottom of the scale of consciousness, shame and guilt and self-loathing and depression. And you're withdrawn from the world as, as worse, as bad as it gets, you're close to death, A. B, if you imagine, is the average person Joe average, overweight, maybe a smoker, drinks on the weekends, not really close with his wife if, if you know, he's in a relationship. He's just getting by, surviving, nothing really to complain about. You wouldn't look at him as the pinnacle or the inspiration for anything, but he's, he's Joe, you know, he's, he's Joe average. Warm at the bar at Cheers. Yeah, hey, he's, he's a good guy. You have a good time with him, but you don't want to be him. And so that's A to B. Most, most people and most frameworks with depression inspire you to, oh, we're going to get rid of, not inspire you, they, they frame it as, oh, we're going to hope to get rid of this depression. In other words, we're going to hope to get you from A, where you feel like killing yourself, to B, just average. And there's nothing beyond that. Like, hopefully you stay at B and you don't slide back to A eventually. That's our job to get you from A to B reading Wayne Dyer and all this motivational stuff, humanistic stuff. He painted that there's, it's never crowded along the extra mile. Don't stop when you're average, when you get to B keep pushing because you keep going. There's something called C there's, there's self-actualization. And that's where you become the best you're supposed to be. You're supposed to master things, live, you know, step into your gifts, your talents, your uniqueness, what your story is, why you went through that process in the first place Depression is such a monster gift, which is when, when I meet with a depressed client, one of the first conversations I have is, man, you don't know how lucky you are. You don't know how lucky you are. And people just, that shakes them because they're like, that, this makes no sense. This is rock bottom. This is the worst my life has ever been. You have no idea what a sword you have in your sheath right now. If you just learn how to use it. And so I'm going to teach you, how do you how to, So unpack that a little bit of what does that mean? So you're, you're at the quote unquote rock bottom. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's the part in the Rocky movie where he's like, Hey, I got nothing to lose. Hey, eh? like, you know, like he comes happy after he loses everything because now there's nothing to take away. So he's at base camp. That's it. And that's it. And sometimes you have to be willing to feel worse before you're going to get better.
that that's another thing I think is really important to kind of out like, and you learn this in sport. And, you know, if you look at great, great athletes, most of them have to learn how to lose before they become really good at winning on a consistent basis. They need to leverage the pain of losing to kind of drive them to the next level to, you know, to rise above an extraordinary group of elite people, right? Um, and we see this, I, th I think it was Jim Rohn in, in the moment of disgust where never again will I deal with this situation, you know? <laughs> yeah. it leverage that negative emotion in a way to move away from in a rapid rate. So that's exactly it. And, and I view really with that person is in that depressive state. Yeah. You, you say, here's your sword. And, and they're, they're, they're okay. Now we're standing here at the deer in the headlights. Like, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? You're not juicing my victimhood. How is this possibly a strength? Then what? So there's an analogy I like to use, which is that when you hit rock bottom, you can either be a basketball or a rock. Mm. rock when it hits rock bottom shatters right mm. it's hard it does it's not yielding it just impacts and and just goes to pieces shatters. most of us approach our rock bottom like that i refuse to go down i refuse to go down i refuse to go down you you eventually hit and you have to be you have to get broken before you let go and you relax and if, you know, I hit rock bottom like a rock, obviously. I did the long distance running thing. I was holding on tight. I'm not going to finish first year with an 83 average or something. Like I held on. I did it. And then at second year, when I couldn't hold on anymore, the rock hit the right after the two, 2004 waterfront marathon, I ran a half marathon a week later, just as self-medication. As soon as I got off the treadmill, I knew that I, that rock had hit the ground and I had shattered. Right. That was the moment where I knew it my one thing, my one coping mechanism is gone. I have nothing else. What happens now? Mm -hmm. And that was me as a rock. And it, it took all this psychology reading, all this consuming people that, that had frameworks more powerful than mine to realize that you can be a basketball. And what a basketball does is it hits rock bottom and it deforms, it absorbs the energy, and then it lifts out and it goes way higher than it ever was before. And so you should almost want to be spiked against rock bottom because I'm, I'm sure a thousand percent sure almost anybody would relate to this, that, you know, the people in your life who have been through some real mm -hmm. and come out on the other side of it, there's a groundedness to their nervous system that you can't fake. That's right. There's a centeredness, there's a presence, there's a big dog energy that you just can't whip up on the spot. Mm -hmm. You have to earn it. And that's what rock bottom is, is it's your earned, you know, fundamental foundation for the rest of your life. And so it's a monster gift if you can learn to see it that way and get the right tools and the people around you to take advantage of it instead of floundering at the bottom of it. And so to, to kind of connect all the dots of the story, you transformed your physique you got uh, all these kind of components. You stacked the deck in your favor. You became a coach, coaching lots of people. Then you transcended that and went into naturopathic medicine, became a doctor, mm -hmm. and are now here as someone. What, what were some of the going related to the depression side of things? Where are you now relative to that story as you kind of move through all of those things? It's wild now to look, I, I mean, I often have to go and find photos of myself then or diaries or something else to relate to who that person was, because it's not that I never have a sad day or an emotion that's down or it, you're still a normal human, but depression is like, you're crying in bed. You can't hold a job. You're listless. You're heavy. It's entirely a different way of being. Mm -hmm. And so I'm fortunate that 15 years running now, I have not been anywhere near in a place like that since. Uh, and, I, and I think that barring, you know, my parents unexpectedly dying or I get cancer at a young age or any age, probably really, um, the next big trauma to hit in my life, I have a lot more tools now than I've ever had. And that's fundamentally the way people need to see their depression is if you don't have any tools, 
it's like sending a goalie. We're going to go a hockey analogy here. It's like sending a goalie, uh, two goalies, right? You got one on the left side of the ice and one on the right side of the ice. You send the guy on the left out with all of the pads. He's got the best right. blocker, the best glove, the, the, both the, the knee pads. He's got the big ass helmet, like with flames on it. The guy's awesome, right? Every, every goalie wants to be here. He's got technique. He's, he's got, got technique. skill. He's got everything. Big and you stick. put the, yeah. And you put the other guy in the other guy in the other crease and he's got a player stick. He's got one skinny knee pad. He's missing his blocker and he's got a baseball glove. Right. And he doesn't have a helmet. So he's scared. Right. Right. How well do you think he's going to stop the puck? He's not. And this is the way people approach depression is you're not eating. You're not eating well. You're not exercising. You're not moving at all. You're staying up till four o'clock in the morning you're using a bunch of substances that are, are short term, you know, your relationships all kind of suck because you blame everybody instead of taking responsibility. You don't have a notebook and a pen. You haven't journaled in months. Um, which goalie are you? Of course, you're the goalie with none of the tools. How, how good are you going to be a hockey? You're going to suck at hockey. It's not that you're a goalie or forever going to be a goalie. It's that, bro, you got to go to play it again sports and pick up some equipment. So true. You mm -hmm. know? And, and now, um, you're not on depressants or on antidepressants mm -hmm. or whatever. You're the picture of health. Uh, you're at the top of your field in your profession. And you're now coming, sharing kind of the tools and the methodology you have. You want to talk about what you're doing right now with the new course and the, the things that you're providing as, as a professional for people who might be suffering from depression? Because there's nobody in the world that would ever meet you on the street today and associate any of those things. I mean, it, like, it's just not, as I, as I gave that legitimate description of you from the time I've known you in all these 15 years, and you've just continued to build on those, those, those fundamental blocks that you've been able to assemble in your life. Yeah, and now I, you're, you're in a position where you can give back and kind of share this to, for mm -hmm. other people who would say, because, because the first thing feels like, oh, you don't understand. I love that. Possibly be in that situation. Like your life's so perfect and everything's so great for you. And you don't know what it's like to be little old, poor, depressed, down in the dumps. No, ever got a chance totally finished and screwed over by everybody and everything my entire life me <laughs> dude right. i love that and some of my favorite clients when i was in clinic some of my favorite patients would be the mid 40s overweight woman who's depressed and and binge eating and i would walk in the room with my clipboard and my stethoscope and they say oh god here's this jock what's he going to tell me how's he going to relate to me and I would immediately get into the nuance of motivational interviewing and making them feel seen and heard and talking about binge eating in a way that they'd be like, how does this guy know me so well? And they would just melt unexpectedly. They would, they would have no idea how, they're, how I, I fundamentally understand the state that you're in because I've been there. I don't look like it, but I've been there. And those would be my favorite people to work with because you could see them write you off as soon as you came in the room. And then by the an hour later, they would be like, wow, I feel more seen and more heard and more understood than the last 20 doctors. Um, and so now having the naturopathic perspective, I've got all these other tools that at the time when I went and sought help, it was the antidepressants alone. Now I've got all these herbals, you know, I've, in this pyramid approach, we go psychology, we build up into the habits, which we talked a little bit about nutrition, exercise, sleep morning and evening routines, you know, you start getting up into the natural realm. So this is making sure that your magnesium is actually, I should take a step back. There's depending on the, depending on the type of depression you have, you could either benefit from antidepressant stimulants or antidepressant comatives mm -hmm. or serotonergics as a third track. So you kind of have to play around with those three and figure which one is your neurochemistry needing. 
If you're needing a little bit more, and obviously I'm going to take a pause here to say, check this by your doctor. I'm not your doctor. I can't prescribe what you should do. Um, don't go monkeying around with yeah. stuff because you can cause serotonin syndrome. Try really this one today and see yeah. what happens. So, so check your doctor before you add any of this kind of stuff. Okay, yourself, but before you wreck yourself. Yeah, but I mean, if if you're looking to go down the serotonergics herbal route, you can add Saint John's Wort. Make sure it's got hypericin and hyperforin. Uh, saffron is another one that's a serotonergic. And then tryptophan, everybody knows tryptophan becomes 5-HTP, serotonin, melatonin even from there. And so those are three serotonergics that I would use with people. If we're looking at more the stimulant class of antidepressants and the herbal antidepressants, I'd look at adaptogens. Mm -hmm. Things like ginseng, rhodiola. You can look even at ashwagandha, which is a mix. Depending on the dose and the person, it can either be a stimulant or a sedative. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the, the herbal antidepressant sedatives, I love kava. It's probably my favorite, my favorite one. Kava, we did a kava. Whole edition on kava, um, one of the episodes, I forget which one it is, we'll put it in the show notes. Mm. Yes, it's so good. Uh, kava, there's valerian, California poppy, uh, passion flower. That's where you can throw magnesium in there, glycine. And so there's a whole number of these calmatives, serotonergics, and stimulants that you can add in the herbal realm. For, for depression. If those are not working, we've done everything else. We're doing the psychology. I'm meeting every single week with somebody. They're limbic resonating. I'm challenging them, motivational interviewing them, helping their frameworks along. Uh, we're doing all the habits so that they're, they're, doing, they're checking their, hab their, their habits every day. We've got a master habit list that we're slowly working on, checking everything off and building, rebuilding their life. Uh, we're doing that. We've got all the diet and exercise stuff. We're trying to go for a walk every day, trying to eat a little bit better as far as colors and nutrient density. Uh, that's not working. The antidepressants or the herbal antidepressants aren't helping on that. I won't hesitate. And especially if it's a severe situation, if the person's severely depressed, we'll add in because we want the, that extra 20% buffer. We'll add in the antidepressants from there. So this could be citalopram, Effexor. I mean, there, there's a very long list of them. And in the course, I'm gonna go into the details on the half-lives the half -lives and the differences. So I won't expand on that here, but the, the antidepressant realm, it's more than placebo, 15 to 20% at least. And so I'd stack that on top and then just make, make sure to keep working things. Above that can be things like any kind of gadgets you might wanna use for tracking, uh, re repeat testing to make sure that, that your blood work all checks out, everything looks good, your micronutrients are all replete, your hormones look good, your testosterone is in range. As a, a side fact, going back to evolution and how it programs us in, in weird ways, it programs us to feel depressed sometimes. New dads get a drop in testosterone by about 33% wow. for a few months. Wow. And, and this makes total sense by evolution. Because if you're a caveman stomping around, you're a silverback gorilla, you're the alpha male of the group, you're, you're, you're having sex with every babe you can find, you're just putting your seeds in everywhere, and then a baby comes along and starts crying, that immediately there's a, there's a kill switch in your brain where evolution says, if you keep stomping around with your club and being alpha, you're going to kill your own kids and wife. You're going to go off the handle and you're not going to take care of them. You're going to go gallivanting and disappear for three weeks. They're going to die. And so evolution's programmed. We got to kick that guy's testosterone down by a third. And so right. new dads, if they're not expecting this, will suddenly be like, I don't know what it is. I'm just feeling this heaviness and, I, and I'm, I'm just not myself anymore since the kid was, I love the kid. We're connecting. Like, I feel like I'm babbling. I'm like doing all these things that are amazing. They're filling up my heart but I'm just not the, I'm the guy that I was before. Great. Right. Enjoy it. It's only going to happen for a few months. Evolution's programmed you so that that kid survives and has the best possible base of a relationship with his dad. So even then evolution works in these weird ways to trigger things that at first we think are a problem. Oh, I got to fix this. I got to go on TRT. I got to do, right. I got to do all this stuff to lift my testosterone. It hasn't been the same since the kid was born. Maybe you're just supposed to be a dad for a little while, a good dad, you know, an emotionally attentive, attuned, calm, chill, oxytocin, babbling dad. 
you so know great. so don't always rush to fix whatever it is with the opposite sometimes there's a benefit you got to find what the benefit is and use that benefit and also you know make sure that it's it's that's what it is it's not something else basically what you've put together here is kind of systematically stacking the deck by dealing with a set of principles and foundational components and putting in a uh, a methodology that you've leveraged yourself and then have now back tested and ran across with all the associative performance parameters and psychological literature and all the medical components. So what is this course? What is it for? Who is it for? How do we get it? Where do we find out about it? Because I know there's going to be a lot of people that will be very interested in learning more about this because if there's anybody I could, that I know that has done an amazing job of, of transformation that so much so that it, you can't even believe what, you know, what you just described, um, you're the, you're the epitome of that. So can, talk about that with our listeners. Well, thanks, man. It's going to be available at drmaximus.com slash depression. If you just go to drmaximus.com, D-R-M-A-X-I-M-U-S.com, you'll find it when it's available. I'm working on it right now, night and day. So it's, uh, I don't have a timeline, I think spring 2021. So it should be done uh, before the summer, but I don't have a hard date. Uh, it's going to be delivered as a course. There's probably going to be a five day free course uh, so that people can sort of whet their appetite and see, is this the kind of guy that I want to limbic resonate with and, and understand this problem through. Uh, and then after that, they can purchase the course. So it'll be ready at drmaximus.com slash depression when it's ready, but I don't know yet when that's going to be. What about all the social media handles and things like that? Because I know you put out a lot of cool stuff. Uh, where can people reach you and find out more about you? And, 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 and of course, for anybody in the Vancouver area, of course, or even uh, you're offering now telemedicine, I believe. Yeah, telemedicine. Uh, I'm most active on Instagram. So people can find me there uh, at Dr. Maximus. And uh, I'm, I'm posting there regularly. You're going to see a lot of stuff there, especially as the depression projects rolling out. You're going to see that. Uh, also building a meditation course, which uh, either, I, I mean, maybe we'll have to unpack that next time. I really want to get your perspective on, on meditation as a tool, uh, mm -hmm. it, your experience and best practices and experiences sure. over time. So that could be a whole other conversation, but uh, I'm going to be building out a meditation course as well. You're going to find out about everything either at my Instagram at Dr. Maximus, or if you go to drmaximus.com, you can add your email into the newsletter and we'll make sure to let you know as soon as there's anything new that's ready to rock. Well, there you have it, folks. Um, from Minimus to Maximus, my good friend, <laughs> Dr. Maximus, the epitome of what you can achieve and overcome if you are experiencing the inevitable situation that all humans do, which is a little bit of depression, a little bit of anxiety, that sort of stuff. How you can leverage that as your sword of truth and rebound from you know, how life spiked you into the pavement to bounce back and hit new levels of productivity, happiness, joy, and enjoying this thing called the human condition. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And for all our listeners out there on the Awesome Health Podcast, I hope you loved it. Of course, we went certainly a lot more informal today as, you know, Dr. Maxwell said, we've known each other for so long and it's such a great time. It's always a joy to hang out with them, spend time with them. And uh, we got a chance just a few months ago to hang out and we're hoping he's going to come down to the bio home right. where I can, you know, school him on my pool game, which is getting pretty, pretty bad, pretty fast. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you on the next episode. Take care. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, how to get away with eating sugar. Hey, look, sugar is normally one of the worst things for you. But let's be honest. I mean, we all cheat from time to time. And here's a little trick that will ensure your body benefits from the sugar. Now, before you eat or drink anything sweet, take five to eight capsules of P3OM. The patented stream in the formula devours sugar so fast, it literally doubles in the body every 20 minutes in the presence of sugar. That doesn't mean that you can or you should eat a bunch of sugar or sit around all day doing that. But on the days that you do cheat or you go and go after one of those maybe meals that you wouldn't normally do, this ensures that you get something in your gut that eats the sugar. And it's not going to feed the bad guys or spike your blood glucose nearly as much. 
So to learn more about P3M and its sugar devouring and protein digesting properties and how it can transform your gut and metabolism, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.